thank you for the invitation. Uh, I should certainly thank Imran for inviting me here. Uh, I come to USC, New York CLA several times to Los Angeles, and actually this is the first time I'm giving a talk in UCLA. That's great. Uh, so you already heard uh, the last talk was on graphene, so it makes my life pretty easier uh, because I'm just going to continue to talk about several materials that has come out of this big graphene discovery, uh, both in terms of composition, in terms of properties. Uh, so as a material scientist, you know, we always wonder uh, what are the challenges in creating a consistent, systematic growth of materials. Uh, what else can you do with these materials and what kind of possible applications these have. So my talk today is actually a, quite a broad range of things that one can do with these type of building blocks. Um, again, very materials uh, uh, related, <coughs> I, although I will mention a few applications here and there. Uh, it's basically about how you can control, how you can uh, manipulate, and how you can consistently get good uh, quality materials. There is again, as I said, a large number of composition that has now emerged after the graphene discovery. Uh, and although it kind of spans across uh, transition metal dichalcogenides to oxides to carbides uh, and even maxines and other kind of materials, I'm going to mostly focus on uh, transition metal di dichalcogenides. Although there are a few compositions like boron, carbon, nitrogen system that we have been quite interested in. Uh, and, the, and the great thing about these uh, uh, range of compositions is that it kind of stands from uh, all kinds of electronic uh, structure, all the way from metallic to semiconductor insulated. But we indeed want to build uh, something all in 2D with all the different electronic uh, characteristics where you can in fact do that because those materials are in fact available. Uh, before I actually uh, talk about the specific aspects of material science aspects on these materials, let me just mention a few typical ways that people make these materials. The most simple way that you can make bulk uh, quantities of these materials is obviously exfoliation, because apparent uh, materials are mostly uh, layered systems, where there is a weaker interlayer forces compared to the inclined forces, so you could very easily exfoliate these or pick up layer by layer uh, using chemical energy that is provided uh, either through fornication or some kind of uh, uh, intercalation. So uh, again, uh, there are many possibilities in terms of chemical exfoliation. I'm just giving you one example. Uh, in fact, this is an interesting example because this is a material that is not you know, traditionally layered. It's not a layered system. Uh, but even though it is not layered, uh, there are certain crystallographic directions along which you can easily uh, cleave uh, these systems specifically or uh, uh, you know, under the right conditions. And you can get super thin layers of uh, uh, iron oxide. This is in fact uh, taken from iron ore, which is hematite, uh, which is really not a magnetic material, but as you get to very thin layers of these in different orientations, you even start seeing some magnetic properties uh, in, in these. Uh, in fact, uh, there is actually a, a library of materials that are possible to be exfoliated. It doesn't necessarily have to be layered. So this particular paper, not from our group, uh, suggests a, a really huge library, layered, non-layered systems, which could be exfoliated and uh, uh, used to extract these super thin 2D uh, layered uh, structures. <coughs> There's another approach that people use very commonly to make 2D layers, and that is physical exfoliation. In fact, the first uh, uh, attempts to make graphene layers were made by the scotch tape uh, type of uh, cleaving method, which I, I generally call uh, physical exfoliation. And again, there are a large number of materials that could be physically exfoliated, particularly the layered st structures. But even the non-layered structures, if you are clever enough, uh, you can play some trick and exfoliate super thin layers. This is just an example, again, a unique example, uh, not a non-layered system. Uh, again, basically it's a, it's a gallium uh, material, which is uh, interesting because it kind of melts very uh, easily at lower temperatures. So what we did in this case was we picked up super thin layers of liquid from the molten gallium and crystallized it on various substrates. Uh, by doing that, we were able to get super thin layers of this gallium or you know, uh, thin layers of gallium, uh, which again uh, is uh, uh, the, the exact properties depend on the crystallographic orientation in which it crystallizes. But nevertheless, uh, most of the uh, layers are essentially metallic because obviously gallium is a metal. Uh, and again, 
you know, one needs to have a, a range of uh, materials with different electronic properties who are ultimately to build devices using this. So gallium was an interesting material because they could be uh, useful for nice contacts on uh, other 2D players and so on. The most commonly used method that we use in our lab is obviously uh, chemical vapor deposition that gives you the ability to do scalable synthesis of these materials. And today, you can really have a very large uh, number of compositions that could be grown by uh, simple CVD techniques or even more sophisticated MOCVD and things like that. So <laughs> this particular uh, approach has been used by a large number of groups and now we have a very large number of uh, possible compositions that could be grown using CVD. Again, there's another paper that came out last year kind of showing a thousand plus family of, of these type of transition metal charcogenides which could be grown by CVD. So uh, in terms of processing, in terms of synthesis now, there's lots of techniques, uh, very well uh, understood and reasonably well defined techniques that can make these type of materials. So with that kind of, uh, and again, in fact, we were one of the pioneers mm -hmm. trying to make these CVD uh, layers of molybdenum sulfide that has grown into now uh, uh, a large set of materials. Uh, now, uh, let me talk about these aspects that I wanted to mention, uh, and I'm, which I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, what are the different types of material science that might be of interest? Uh, but just to start with, uh, let me say that the 2D building blocks are themselves kind of unique. Uh, because if you take one of these layers and put them on a different substrate, uh, even the transfer process can create uh, defects and other uh, changes in the intrinsic structure which actually changes properties. Or in, other, in other words, you know, there's a strong structure property correlations when you go to low dimensions. And this is going to be seen in nanoparticles, nanotubes, even 2D layers. So even just laying it on a, on a different substrate, you can see that all these defects come into play, you know, blisters and wrinkles and things like that, which seems to have an impact on the property. So it has to, uh, you know, have some level of caution uh, in kind of generalizing uh, you know, many of these uh, techniques that we use to make and transfer, uh, because each one of those might create certain type of defects that ultimately changes the behavior. So uh, again, a bunch of talking points that I have here. I don't know if I'll get time to go through all of these, but I will certainly uh, try to talk uh, about a few things that we have been pursuing in our lab in the past few years. So let me first talk about defects. Obviously, you know, defects are quite important in any type of materials, but when you come to smaller dimensions, defects become even more interesting and uh, important. The uh, unfortunate thing is that there is no real way to categorize or really to uh, quantify defects in many of the systems. So many of the results that you see in literature has a broad range of variations, partly because you really don't understand or characterize the defects in this, uh, in this material. And the simplex defect in, uh, in a 2D layer would be a grain boundary. Obviously, if you're doing this by CVD, you uh, are growing by nucleation growth, and you'll end up with grain boundary. I mean, the great boundaries in 2D systems are obviously very interesting because uh, it, it involves these topological defects, whether it's a graphene or whether it is a TMD system. You do have these uh, odd member rings that ultimately changes the local electronic structure. So, on the one hand, you know, these great boundaries are kind of problematic. First of all, you don't really you know, totally understand these, uh, how much of these great boundaries are present, which will dictate the electronic properties or scattering of electrons. But on the other hand, these are kind of interesting. You know, many people have suggested, you know, theoretically, that uh, these could be magnetic. You know, the, the tunneling behavior of electrons across various kinds of grain boundaries could be different. So that, that's uh, the curious aspect of it. And there is still a lot of work going on trying to understand the properties of these grain boundaries. Uh, very similar story in the case of transition metal dichalbidonides, you still have these topological defects, although it's a little bit more complicated because it's not a single elemental material. So uh, the great boundaries could be, uh, you know, uh, sulfur uh, deficient, for example, and then uh, the structure becomes slightly different. But nevertheless, these are quite interesting uh, entities because they kind of bring in uh, uh, certain properties like magnetism into the structure. Again, I, I want to emphasize that there's very few studies that systematically catalog the, the kind of defects that exist in these uh, systems, these structures. 
Uh, this is one paper that we published a few years ago that talks about various types of foreign defects that can exist in these. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of uh, uh, believe that unless you really uh, understand or categorize these defects in these materials, we do have a problem at hand uh, in terms of consistently getting data. This is a good example. It's not our work, but it's taken from Jim Horn's group in Columbia, essentially suggesting the importance of defects. So there are two, uh, the same material, uh, grown in two different ways, and they painstakingly find the densities of defects using all kinds of techniques. Uh, and you can see the difference in, the, in their PL spectrum. You know, you do uh, two or three orders of magnitude in the defect density, and you completely change the electronic uh, uh, you know, structure. So this is something to bear in mind as we develop these materials for applications and so on. There has to be simpler, more direct, more uh, fast ways of uh, characterizing defects uh, because that is ultimately going to change the, the properties of these. <coughs> of course, on the other hand, people are trying to grow larger uh, you know, uh, uh, domains or larger grain uh, grains structure. In the case of graphene, obviously, you've heard that uh, you could get pretty large grains these days millimeter size. Even for TMDs, you can get to uh, you know, grain sizes that are pretty uh, big, essentially getting to the point uh, of getting single crystals. But obviously, the ultimate goal would be to actually get single crystals of these materials by uh, looking at uh, uh, growth techniques. <laughs> now, you could also engineer defects specifically into these materials that would allow you to access some properties. Uh, you know, uh, properties like catalysis would certainly be impacted by defects. In fact, we have shown that uh, hydrogen treatment of some of these uh, MOS2 uh, exposes more edge uh, atoms and that improves the catalytic behavior. Uh, on the other hand, uh, oxygen treatment actually uh, you know, creates different types of edge terminations which does not improve uh, you know, the properties that you're looking for. So again, I think you could uh, think about treatments that allow you to specifically engineer a certain type of defects that might be of interest. Uh, and then there are other systems where the defects uh, exist quite uh, uh, randomly, uh, or you know, if you could control them, that would be very interesting. One, one such system is hexagonal boron nitride, very popular material, both the substrates as well as uh, uh, a strong material, uh, or even uh, you know, uh, the combination of defects in boron nitride, like carbon, uh, dopants in boron nitride has been now very much uh, used to look at uh, single photon emission and uh, interesting electronic properties like that. So I think you know, the various ways you can create defects, either the point defects are interesting, or even the dopant defects, uh, that would be quite uh, uh, nice to control. <coughs> now, uh, different dopants can introduce different properties, obviously. Uh, what we have done is uh, we have worked quite a bit with uh, nitrogen and boron doping of carbon materials. So these are essentially carbon yeah. ribbons which have been doped with nitrogen and carbon and they obviously uh, show very interesting uh, electrocatalytic behavior. And I'll, I'll again mention later on this whole idea, or emerging idea of uh, nitrogen doping in carbons creating uh, low dimensional structures of carbon with nitrogen doping, uh, which is uh, useful not just for catalysis, but also for other things like uh, energy storage. So doping, again, uh, becomes quite, uh, quite an interesting aspect in all these 2D systems. Again, these are something that has not been systematically studied too much. Now, <coughs> there are other systems as well. I'll just give you an example of a very recent work which is not published. Uh, we were looking at uh, a non-stoichiometric, uh, or rather unstable, but a stable material like molyoxide, MO2, and uh, th these are not really, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, bulk form of this material is centrosymmetric, a triangle structure, uh, uh, but what happens is that when you grow these into ultra-thin films, uh, they form all these uh, defects, uh, even you know, by uh, dye vacancies and clusters of vacancies, and these trap charges, and they uh, give you certain properties like piezoelectricity. So something like molyoxide, which is not piezoelectric, because it's central symmetric, when it comes to very thin uh, uh, layers and then there are defects in this, you get pretty uh, large values for piezoelectric constants compared to uh, perhaps the, the best values that you obtain for uh, uh, 2D layers like polysulfide. Now, uh, chemical modification, obviously that is uh, very much a material science thing uh, and there are many, many 
works in literature that talk about how you can uh, change the chemistry of these 2D layers, uh, specifically engineering these for applications like energy storage, graphene, graphene oxide or graphite oxide has been well known uh, because they, they are, you know, if you can control the amount of uh, functionality from these layers, they could be interesting for several applications including energy storage. Uh, again, you can go beyond just simple oxidation of carbon, you can introduce for example fluorine, uh, and you can have a good combination of uh, various <coughs> uh, amounts of fluorine uh, and oxygen which allows you to create graphitic structures that are quite interesting. You can control the hydrophobicity and stuff like that in these. Uh, and they are being used for many uh, applications including uh, not only their optical behavior, uh, imaging and, and so on. Other materials can also be chemically modified. Some of them more difficult than the others. Hexagonal boronitide is actually a very unreactive material, but there has been lots of uh, reports in recent times on how you can uh, you know, controllably change the chemistry of boronitride uh, using things like, for example, uh, fluorination of boronitride. And these fluorinated boronitrides seem to have, again, some ferromagnetic properties. And again, uh, this is something that uh, uh, is of great interest. But many of these, you know, real harsh chemical treatments uh, destroy the essential bonding in these materials. So if you take graphene and fluorinated or hydrogenated, essentially you go from sp2 to sp3 bonding. Uh, so it changes the topography, changes the topology of this material. What might be of interest is to actually also look at uh, milder chemical uh, treatments, uh, maybe something like a Lewis acid-based type of chemistry where the surface reaction is almost self-limited. <laughs> so we have also done some work in different types of, uh, in this particular case, is indium selenide material, where uh, you can do the, the chemistry to create complexes on the surface. So that doesn't really destroy the two-dimensional nature of the material, but actually changes the local electronic structure. So there's also these milder types of chemical reactions that might be of interest for, uh, uh, you know, the, the 2D uh, layer systems in the long run. Of course, another major chemistry that people have looked, uh, people did look in graphite and other materials is the intercalation. You know, in the case of 2D, uh, other systems like TMDs, it's not been uh, uh, done to a large extent, although the graphite intercalation chemistry was known uh, for a very long time and a lot of people who worked on this in the 60s and 70s. Uh, because they were not very stable, they had to give it up, but even in the other 2D systems, uh, there are possibilities of introducing uh, you know, atoms inside these galleries or into their spacing. And this is just an example, which is not published, where the copper atoms can be nicely intercalated into certain TMDs, which changes the electronic structure uh, quite dramatically in these materials. Particularly things like uh, the niobium, like the tantalum, sulfides, and selenides. If you do this, uh, you actually change the superconducting transitions, you change the electrical conductivity. So a lot, lot of things can be done if you can controllably intercalate these. And uh, you know, again, this is an area that has not been really pursued too much uh, with all these stacks of different materials that people are trying to make. If you can also use the galleries uh, to intercalate, of course, intercalation is a common phenomenon that we uh, use for energy storage and other things, but even the electronic structure, if you can make a stable intercalated uh, 2D stack, that would be quite fascinating. And then you can also think about uh, you know, chemistries that involve interfacial uh, uh, you know, additions or using molecular systems like uh, self assembled monolayers uh, to change the uh, electron transfer between the layers that you use and the substrate that you have. So again, uh, this is interesting because uh, it has been shown that uh, if, you, uh, if I put a, a self assembled monolayer between the substrate and the layer, the transport in the layer can be controlled, depending on the terminations that you have on the surface of the monolith. So there's a lot of molecular chemistry that you can play around with to change the overall behavior or, or overall transport in these 2D layer systems. Another option, if you actually go a little bit further in, in doing chemistry or even uh, you know, breaking down these kind of 2D layers, is to be able to create nanostructures of different dimensionality starting from these 2D layers. <coughs> Things like uh, of course, the exfoliation has been the most commonly used technique for uh, you know, extracting these layers out of layer systems. But uh, there are other uh, possibilities. For example, you know, uh, one might be interested in uh, etching these layers along uh, specific crystallographic directions. You know, can you make ribbons out of these? Can you make uh, 
quantum doors, <coughs> uh, so or, or even you know layer by layer etching of these two dimensional layer systems could be of great interest. So this is a simple uh, chemistry that we did recently, where the monosulfide uh, you know, uh, undergoes a very interesting transformation. It gets etched along certain crystallographic directions, and uh, we even see that uh, those directions uh, are essentially uh, zigzag type of uh, orientation uh, if I'm etching these layers along uh, using that chemistry that I mentioned to you. So there is a lot of uh, interesting things you can do uh, from the point of view of chemistry to be uh, not only able to change the electronic structure but also to uh, structure the material uh, differently. Of course, the quantum dots is something that has been very popular. Uh, graphene quantum dots are now used in all kinds of things. Uh, and again, uh, now uh, you can uh, these things are available in bulk. Uh, we were one of the early groups to suggest that you can actually break up these layers very nicely into uh, these kind of structures. Uh, and these uh, you know, quantum dots of carbon that are doped with nitrogen or boron, they seem to have some uh, very nice uh, electrocatalytic behavior. In fact, even in the case of CO2 reduction, people have now uh, been able to utilize these uh, doped carbon uh, dots. Uh, and also the optical properties are obviously very nice. Uh, we have been looking at some of these recently a published work, but essentially showing that you can control and you can engineer these quantum dots across the entire spectrum uh, of visible uh, light. This is a CO2 reduction. It's already published in Nature Communications last year, uh, but essentially suggesting that these doped uh, carbon dots can be very, very interesting. <coughs> also, uh, one could, again, you know, there, there's obviously going to be a variation of the dimensions when you simply break up something in, uh, in a solution. Uh, but one can play some tricks, and this is actually one of the tricks that we have uh, played in recent times, where you use a cryo-induced uh, exfoliation technique. So you don't really break up the layers uh, at the room temperature, but at a much lower temperature. Either you dump these into liquid nitrogen, then exfoliate, and then break up. Uh, or you can do that uh, at low temperatures. And when you do that, you get a much uh, finer distribution of these quantum dots from all kinds of materials. So this cryo-initiated uh, liquid ferrous exfoliation the breakup of the crudy layers gives you much finer, much more uniform distribution of quantum dots. And you can actually do this on all, pretty much all kinds of uh, 2D layer systems. Uh, again, that's just a, a detail. And, and also, you can also do this, you know, you don't have to do this by chemistry alone. You can do lithography to get these nice quantum dots and Obviously, that has a different uh, uh, type of applications. In particular case, they were looking at glass models in these uh, uh, quantum dots. Now, there is also a possibility of using these exfoliated layers uh, and building up three-dimensional architectures, particularly porous architectures. And uh, uh, again, there's lots of fascinating things in literature suggesting that if you can con you know, connect these 2D layers or even low-dimensional structures, you could build some uh, very interesting uh, uh, materials. So this, even in the case of carbon, uh, you know, there are various predictive structures that uh, make you uh, that, that gets you to very uh, high conductivity carbons and other types of carbons. Of course, you know, to that precision, it's still very difficult to build uh, three-dimensional structures from 2D. But you know, one can think of creating these interconnections using chemistry, or even build these interconnected structures using vapor phase. So you could get pretty large volume uh, material systems by simply interconnecting these 2D layers. Uh, and they obviously are very porous. They have some interesting properties like gas storage and things like that. Uh, but there is, a, uh, you know, again, a large number of activities in trying to build this three-dimensional, uh, almost cough type of materials using uh, these 2D building blocks. And again, it can be carbon, it can be other 2D layers. But nevertheless, you can actually make all kinds of things. And uh, the, these graphene poles are quite interesting. We have had quite a long collaboration with the auction chance group from Nankai. And uh, what he has seen over the years is this uh, amazing level of thermoelasticity in these materials. So these foam-like materials made of carbon, graphene, that are interconnected, show elasticity at very high temperatures and very low temperatures. Very low temperatures even uh, to almost cryogenic temperatures. So a recent experiment that was published in Science Advances a couple of months ago, uh, they actually built a, a, a chamber that allows you to do mechanical testing at uh, cryogenic temperatures. 
and they, they, these kind of foams look very, very elastic even at that very low temperature. So that's you know, something like graphene-based uh, porous structures are fascinating because there's no other material that has this kind of thermoelastic range. Uh, you know, about 1,000 degrees Celsius under reducing conditions and to cryogenic temperatures. So that's kind of impressive uh, mechanical behavior in these uh, interconnected 3D structures. But of course, the most fascinating thing recently, or in the last few years, have been the ability uh, to pick up different layers of different compositions and stack them together into these artificially stacked uh, Van der Waals solids. So that is really uh, the game that we are beginning to play. I think many groups are now starting to build these different stacks and uh, uh, groups in UCLA and you know, similar beautiful things. So I think there is all kinds of possibilities because now we have these different layers of different compositions. The question is if you put them together, what kind of uh, new material properties arise? <coughs> And uh, uh, of course, when you're doing this, there are some challenges, obviously, because uh, first of all, these indi individual layers uh, exist in multiple phases. So most of the TMDs exist as uh, 2H and 1D prime phase. So you have to first make sure that what phase you actually got. And secondly, when you stack them together, there are these rotational uh, you know, disorders that would happen. So there are, depending on the different kind of stacking that you have in these TMDs, you could have different properties. So, it's, it's a problem that can be you know, quite uh, significant uh, and very difficult to control many times, but there has been some attempts to show that under certain circumstances you can actually get certain type of stacking. Uh, this was a very simple thing that we did many years ago, where we took uh, more nitride layers and carbon layers, uh, graphene layers, and then simply mixed them together and graphitized them. So you essentially get a composition that has boron nitride and graphene in the stack, but quite randomly uh, distributed. Right? Uh, and again, it depends on the, the starting material because the particle sizes matter a lot. But nevertheless, you could get these hybrid uh, graphitic type of structures that contains more than one composition. And obviously, they have a different electronic structure, uh, the bulk properties are quite different. Uh, mechanical properties are different. So I think it's very interesting, this whole idea that you might take multiple layers of different compositions, uh, layer systems, and then restack them and graphitize them. Right? Again, uh, if you can control the stacking, then that would be even more interesting. In terms of control stacking, uh, the TMDs have been quite uh, 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 popular. Uh, people have looked at various types of those techniques, uh, either putting in one precursor at a time or multiple precursors uh, together to build these type of stacks of uh, varying compositions. And uh, again, a few years ago, we were able to show that, particularly for this system, tungsten sulfide and polysulfide, you can get a preferred 2 edge stacking. And uh, again, these are some uh, specific experiments suggesting that at higher temperatures, the stacking of bilayers are preferred, whereas at lower temperatures, these in-plane junctions uh, uh, you know, uh, start to build quite uh, readily. And now, of course, there is a lot of interest in this twistronics, you know, how you control the twist angles between the different layers. The graphene bilayers have been now popular in terms of showing superconductivity and so on. But even for TMDs, it will be extremely fascinating to control the amount of angle that you have between the two layers. And this is some recent results that shows that uh, the interlayer excitons are pretty low in energy in these type of systems if you control the stacking angle. This is something that we have done mostly through with uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy uh, of these uh, molecules by tungsten selenide system. Now, as I just pointed out, in addition to the stacking, uh, what is really fascinating with the 2D layers is that the in-plane uh, junctions, almost atomically sharp junctions, could be formed, and they could be of great interest. Uh, this is, a, a, again, a particular system, boron carbon nitrogen system. And again, in most of these isostructural materials, like boron nitride and carbon, uh, one could think about having this seamless uh, uh, junction between these two. Uh, so we have done quite a bit of work in trying to engineer these kind of uh, hybrid uh, 2D systems with different domains, with different shapes, different sizes. So what could easily uh, you know, build these type of structures where the graphene is completely embedded within the lattice of the uh, boron nitride or vice versa. And you know, something like this would be a, a beautiful antenna in 2D. Uh, not only these are isostructural, the junctions are pretty strong, so once you form, you can actually transfer them to other flexible substrates and so on. There are some other uh, patterns. <coughs> so 
the boron nitrogen carbon system, where the interface between boron nitride and carbon is actually very covalent. Uh, but there are many of these two TMD systems that are also isostructural, and you can think about uh, having them uh, form this uh, interlayer junction. Molytelluride is a, a beautiful example because it forms very easily through H and 1T prime, and the energetics between these two phases are pretty similar. So if I just simply start to grow molytelluride, without uh, you know, worrying about the specific optimized conditions, what I will see is a random distribution of the 1T prime phase and the 2H phase. <laughs> of course, the idea was to use the 1T prime, which is more metallic, to be areas where you can put the contact and use the 2H phase as a channel. Right? And uh, uh, so, one could do that, you can randomly grow these and go and look for the 1T prime regions and then put the contacts and you get reasonably good devices. Right? But, uh, uh, but that's not what people want. People actually want to specifically find, uh, you know, convert an area where there is two edge to one T prime, so that you know exactly where these one T primes are. Right? So there are multiple papers not, uh, from our group in literature uh, talking about various ways of converting the two edge phase into one T prime in molecular But all these you know techniques are pretty uh, 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 you know time consuming and quite tedious. So we were uh, trying to figure out a way to actually create these patterns of 1P prime and 2H phase in a systematic way, in a scalable fashion. So uh, what we realized is that uh, some of these tellurides, like tungsten tellurides, uh, is always 1T prime. The, the energetics uh, basically favor the 1T prime phase. Uh, so and not only that, by doping tungsten into molytelluride, you can actually get to more and more metallic phases. So what we did, was that uh, during growth, uh, we actually pre-patterned uh, uh, an under layer of tungsten in regions and then grew the molecularite. So during the growth of molecularite, the tungsten actually diffused into the regions where it was patterned and we got the 1T prime phase in those regions. So essentially now we could grow very large areas of these 1T prime 2H, 1T prime 2H periodic structures uh, by simply uh, you know, using this uh, doping technique of tungsten into a molecular uh, Again, there are other types of junctions. Now, this is a slightly different junctions where there's a 2H, 1T prime, but the compositions are different. You know, although still very isostructural, but instead of the molecular 2H, 1T prime, you can actually get two different compositions. One is 1T and the other one is 2H. So, you can recent, you know, recently you can do all these, uh, uh, all these <coughs> tricks to get very nice heterojunctions, where the junction is almost atomically sharp. Uh, and of course, the other interesting thing would be to actually create alloys of these. And uh, you know, most of the work that you see are either two or three component systems, but there is no uh, limit to actually uh, increasing the number of compositions, number of components in these uh, phase diagrams to really get uh, beautiful alloys, which are, again, been very little explored in the TMD system. Uh, you know, unlike the boron nitrogen carbon system, where there's strong segregation of BN and carbon, here you can put uh, you know, alloying elements and they distribute pretty nicely. So you can put the selenium into molysulfide and the selenium will go and distribute pretty nicely in the system because they are very similar uh, in structure. Uh, and you can actually go all the way uh, across the entire concentration range to uh, allow some change of band gap and band gap engineering. <coughs> so uh, again, one has to realize that if you go from two component to multiple components, you have a better chance of changing the band gap. You know, the amount of band gap you can vary is much uh, slightly larger. So you go from binary to quaternary, you increase the band gap range that you can get by changing the concentration of these uh, species. Uh, so in the end, you know you could get things like this, which are really completely alloyed systems. This is a four-component system: the moly, tungsten, sulfur, selenium. And uh, it's also interesting because if you, if you imagine a system like moly tungsten uh, solvent selenium, the, the metal atoms, of course, are inter, uh, you know, dispersed in the central uh, layer, but uh, it's not very clear where the sulfur and selenium sits. They could actually sit at the top or the bottom. Uh, of course, this beautiful image from Oak Ridge National Lab uh, kind of tells you where the sulfur and selenium are sitting, uh, or sulfur sulfur are sitting in each of the atomic columns. So the alloy systems have not been explored again. I think there's a lot of opportunity in looking at alloys and seeing how they, uh, what kind of electronic properties we get. And 
as you increase the components, the question is really, uh, you know, uh, do you still get crystallinity, but at some level of compass, or at some number of components, maybe they would completely randomize and you could possibly make a 2D glass or something like that. So there's a lot of interesting things here. How much time do I have? A couple of minutes, yeah. I think uh, uh, almost done. So when you have these multiple components and, and a phase diagram for these type of uh, alloys, uh, one has to also look at the stability of these. You know, this phase stability is going to be a major issue if you're going to use these type of uh, structures for applications. And uh, obviously you can see that uh, you know, phase stability depends on temperature or composition. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, how does the phase diagram of these 2D layers look like? So we have seen a couple of uh, multiple instances where uh, one can go from a completely alloyed system to a segregated system if I, uh, you know, change the temperature. So this again has to be studied. If these type of materials are to be used in applications, one needs to understand how the phase stability uh, changes, or you know, by adding uh, a non-isomorphous or non-miscible uh, element into the system, one could also force the segregation. So if I take this moly tungsten sulfide or moly selenide uh, sulfur and add a little bit of tin into the system, they actually force these uh, uh, these <coughs> compositions to segregate. So again, you know, this is really metallurgy or material science uh, you know, in its core because you're really trying to find the phase stability, the phase diagram uh, of these multi-component systems in 2D. So I'm kind of... Uh, 